I'm Andy Agathangelo, the founder of the Transparency Task Force. Uh, the Transparency Task Force is a UK-based but very international community of people who are working together around the world to clean up the financial sector and reform the regulatory framework that is supposed to be governing it. Uh, we've been operating since 2015, having grown organically. We're quite a size. And I think it's fair to say that we are punching well above our weight in terms of drawing attention to the sorts of issues that are impacting the consumers of financial services products uh, right, around the, right around the world. Today's session, as everybody knows, is about the Edinburgh reforms. And in particular, we're going to be talking about the senior managers certification regime. Um, to put all this into context, I'm going to draw attention to a book that we published a couple of years ago. Um, the book is entitled, Why We Must Rebuild Trustworthiness and Confidence in Financial Services and How We Can Do It. And the reason I'm making reference to our book is because of what is written on the inside cover. I'm pretty sure you won't be able to see this, but um, just in case you can, there it is. It says, uh, this book is dedicated to the memory of the 10,000 plus people who have committed suicide as a consequence of malpractice, malfeasance, misconduct and mis-selling by the financial services sector. It's a very stark way to start a meeting like this, I know, but let me explain precisely why, precisely why I'm doing that. Um, First of all, that figure of 10,000 is not something I've just plucked out of the air, I promise you. Um, it's actually uh, from research carried out by Oxford University and others. I'm going to share my screen and um, show you this. So this is um, a piece. Um, the actual article was in the medical journal, uh, sorry, the medical magazine, the journal. And um, it's covered here by the BBC, 12th of June, 2014. And as you can see, the headline is, recession led to 10,000 suicides. Um, when you read the article, and I will put the link to it in the chat, the article explains that there were 10,000 plus suicides across the UK, the rest of mainland Europe, Canada, and the USA. So that's not the worldwide figure. The worldwide figure would obviously have been significantly more than that, but just UK, mainland Europe, Canada, USA, 10,000 suicides. And what the article says is that um, a lot of people, 10,000 plus people, quite simply lost the will to live. Uh, many of these are individuals who suffered acute depression because, for example, the banking crisis led to a recession that led to them losing their jobs. They lost their jobs, they couldn't pay their mortgages. The, the, the inability to carry on living in the family home led to all kinds of stresses and strains within the family. Um, and that led 10,000 plus people to um, take their own lives. And what on earth has that got to do with the Edinburgh reforms and the senior manager certification regime? It does appear as though the Edinburgh reforms and the senior manager certification regime are an attempt to wind back the consumer protections that have been fought and won over decades. So one could argue that what we have right now is a reversal of all the really important regulatory achievements and milestones that have um, happened over, you know, over recent decades. Prior to the, the global financial crisis, uh, my understanding is that something called the Glass-Steagall Act was repealed. 
And my understanding is that the Glass-Steagall Act had its roots, this is an American piece of legislation, had its roots in the regulatory reforms that go all the way back to how the regulators and society responded to the, um, the, the you know, the great crash of the 20s. Uh, absolutely, yeah, the, the, the Great Depression. And I'm making this point, and clearly you're with me already here, ahead of me, no doubt, that many people believe that the repealing of the Glass-Steagall Act was one of the contributory factors that took the, um, that took the stabilizing wheels off the financial system, which uh, frankly meant that it could fall over, which it, you know, catastroph catastrophically did in 2000. Eight, nine. That idea of having stabilizer wheels, you know, when you teach a young child to ride his or her bike, they've got those little stabilizer wheels. There's so much logic in the idea that if something is fundamentally unstable, make it stable, put stabilizer wheels on it. The Glass Steagall Act was something a bit like stabilizing wheels. The Edinburgh reforms are as crazy as it sounds, they appear to be an attempt to get rid of some stabilizing wheels, which takes you to some really interesting questions. You know, what are the driving forces behind this dilution of regulatory protection? Why is it happening? You know, despite the fact that there are many, many academics and other very, very bright people around the world saying, no, 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 whatever you do, don't allow the financial sector to behave in an unruly way. What, why, is it, why is it still happening? And in particular, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be talking about the senior manager's certification regime. I've got vague memories of, and please do forget, correct me if I've got this wrong, but I've got vague memories of um, Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, saying after the global financial crisis, that the single biggest learning from all that experience was how difficult it was to actually make particular individuals accountable for what had gone wrong. And the upshot of all that was a very sensible idea. Let's put in new, new rules and regulations that make people individually accountable. If there's greater individual accountability, people are going to be less likely to take ridiculous risks. They're going to think twice. We'll hold the potentially rogue individuals in check. And as a consequence, the system as a whole is going to be that much safer, that much more, that much more resilient to you know, the excesses of risk taking and bonus chasing and all the rest of it. Um, bizarrely enough, my understanding is the senior manager's certification regime has only actually been used twice. Uh, once was about a month ago, the, the chat responsible, the catastrophic Lloyd's TSB IT crash was one of those two people. Um, why was it only used twice, despite the egregious level of the egregious level of malpractice in the financial industry? And not only is the question, why was it only used twice? Why are they actually having serious conversations about getting rid of it? replacing it and in terms of the idea of the um, egregious levels of um, harm in the in the financial system if I may I'm going to share some information with you which you may already be pretty pretty familiar with I, I do I do share information about violation tracker quite frequently because it's so it's so relevant to um, to, to, to what we're trying to do here um, so a violation tracker is the uh, free to use database produced by um, a Washington DC NGO. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a very good, very powerful database. And what it shows, and I'll, I'll get to the link later on during the course of the, of, the, of the session. It basically shows that of all the industry, the one industry that is most transgressive, one industry that breaks the rules more than any other, according to the amount of fines levied against it, is the financial sector. So you would hardly think there's any empirical evidence justifying the idea that it's a good idea to dilute the levels of consumer protection. That does appear, as I'm saying, to be precisely what is, uh, what is going on 
uh, right now. In a, in a moment, we're going to pass over to Mark Bishop. Uh, I have Mark Bishop to pay for many things, uh, including the idea of this event. Um, Mark and I were talking about the two consultations, the, um, uh, the consultation in relation to um, uh, the consultation in relation to the PRA and the FCA. And we thought it would make a lot of sense to have a kind of a conversation with some of our members prior to making any firm decisions about the general direction of travel of our the general direction of travel of our, our of our responses uh, and that led to the idea of having this get together to kick ideas around uh, mark and i will be absorbing the input that we gather during the course of the day session and making sure that we uh, we feed that into uh, the conversation we're going to be we're going to be having today so on that note um could i please invite mark bishop to uh, uh, take himself off mute and uh, share with us his kind of opening remarks about the consultations and we'll go from there. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mark, over to you, cheers. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Andy. I'd just like to check that everybody can hear me, okay? Yes, I can, yeah. Brilliant, okay, so if you could please just go to the next slide and uh, just on that uh, intro slide, what I'm gonna do is to talk about the SMCR, the Senior Managers and Certification Regime. And the reason is that there are two parallel consultations about it at the moment, one from the FCA and one for, from the Treasury. Um, and the most important thing we have to do is to respond to those by the 1st of January. Um, and I think it's important that we also do some PR around that uh, because uh, otherwise they just go into a black hole. They're not even published by those two statutory bodies. Um, so there's no uh, way of anybody establishing uh, what kind of responses were made to the consultation and what the balance is of the points that were made. So my first slide here relates to what's wrong with the current scheme. Uh, the industry has a complaint, quite widely heard about the SMCR, and that is that because over time it's been extended to include more and more people, so not just the people at the top and not just people in banks, um, that has created a large amount of work uh, in authorising these people. I think the idea is that uh, authorising an individual who is within SMCR is a more onerous task than authorising an individual onto the register that's not within SMCR. So there's been a bottleneck. This has actually led to a vicious circle. What happens is that firms gain the application process. So a firm will put in an application. Let's say they've made a job offer to somebody or they intend to promote somebody internally in a few months' time. They put in an application that is incomplete. They know it's incomplete. They're not worried about that. It's about buying themselves a position in the queue. And over time, in, at the request of the FCA, they provide more information. Of course, the problem with this is it's creating extra work for the FCA. So it takes longer to handle each application than it needs to. So you get this vicious circle. And of course, one of the uh, risks to that is that the FCA will find ways of short circuiting this process because they're under pressure from the industry to accelerate their yeah. handling of these uh, applications. I think I saw recently uh, in the Treasury Committee, uh, somebody from the industry said, you know, if you are, for example, you know, a reinsurer and you can open, you can authorize an individual in, um, in the Bahamas in a week, but it takes three months in London, why would you employ those people in London? Um, the fact that they're asking that question kind of tells you that there is a problem here. We are competing at the bottom end of the market and not at the top. Um, so the FCA is responding actually by trying to accelerate these um, processes of the handling of these applications. And it's doing that by outsourcing the approval process. Uh, it's doing it, for example, to firms such as uh, BDO. I think Accenture might be one as well. But they are firms that do a lot of work for the financial services industry. Uh, in the case of BDO, that is itself FCA authorised. So there may perhaps be a bit of a conflict of interest here. I'm not sure it's the right outcome. And particularly one of the problems with outsourcing is that designing a contract and measuring performance, it's very tempting to measure performance uh, and even to pay by the number of applications that have been processed in a given period of time. So built into the system of the SMCR is a defect, which is authorising and approving people who shouldn't have been let through. So the risk of bad, bad actors getting through is considerable. The other problem, which we look at from the consumer perspective, is negligible levels of enforcement. Uh, Andy has already said that 
uh, SMCO has only been used twice. It's actually only been used once by the FCA. Uh, it's been used once also by the PRA. The IT guy that was criticized for the um, technical migration, the migration to a, a, a Spanish platform for um, TSP uh, was actually uh, done by um, the PRA, not by the FCA. So the FCA has done it once, and that was the Jess Staley case. And the Staley case is, I think, probably the epitome of regulatory complacency and capture. Uh, just to recap what happened there, um, uh, there was a whistleblower uh, from his time at JP Morgan, uh, who was trying to make out that he was too close, uncomfortably close, uh, to the convicted paedophile Jeffrey Epstein. Um, there may have been allegations about what he did for Epstein, but what there certainly was an allegation is that he had attempted or succeeded in hiring into Barclays an individual he used to work with at uh, JPM uh, who allegedly had some kind of compromise on him, perhaps in relation to his uh, links to Epstein, uh, and that this was an inappropriate, cronyistic, or perhaps even a payoff type hire. Um, so what happened there was that the FCA firstly uh, didn't look at uh, the underlying evidence from the whistleblower. So you might think, actually, if a bank chief executive is being accused of links to a paedophile, it might be worth investigating that. He didn't even look at the stage above that, which was actually, is he involved in some kind of cronyist hiring? It wasn't interested in that at all. They just looked at the treatment of the whistleblower. And famously, uh, in front of the Treasury Committee, Andrew Bailey, at the time the chief executive of the FCA, said uh, that Stelling was, uh, quotes, uh, not dishonest, he was stupid. So his argument was this guy didn't know that hiring private investigators using the bank's money to find out who the whistleblower was, which involved bribing, allegedly, employees of the US Post Office, Postal Service, was not in any way inappropriate. Um, now, maybe he could be that stupid. It seems to me unlikely. But the flaw in the narrative is that actually uh, Bailey, uh, sorry, uh, Staley started doing this. And then the, the head of whistleblowing at Barclays said to him, this is not allowed. Please stop. And he went on and continued to do it. So actually, he was both stupid and dishonest. He was dishonest. Uh, and he was excused of dishonesty that he wasn't sacked. And all that happened is he was fined, a fine that could easily be bonused away. Of course, what we're now finding out via litigation in the US is that there are allegations that he was effectively the banker to some kind of trafficking, some human trafficking type enterprise that was being run by, um, by his friend Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, and he's using phrases, euphemisms, uh, that could be seen to imply that he knew that some of these uh, girls that he was uh, consorting with were underage. So, uh, you know, I'm being very careful what I'm saying here. I haven't accused them of anything illegal. Uh, but what I have very strongly implied is that the regulator worked very hard to put the most positive spin possible on the alleged misconduct and even harder not to look at the very serious implications of the episode that actually probably should have led to the guy uh, being investigated, kicked out of the industry possibly prosecuted when nothing happened. So uh, the other point, of course, from the point of view of a consumer or campaigner, is that there is little or no evidence of conduct improvement. The current practice, which is to pretend to make individuals responsible for the actions of the firms that they direct, while actually finding those firms, by which I mean finding the innocent shareholders of the firms, because they're the people who pay the fines. They didn't know what was going on, they weren't, certainly weren't perpetrators. Even if they had known, they wouldn't have been able to stop it. That policy appears not to be working. Individual accountability, which was the theory of SMCR, uh, would be a, perhaps a good idea, but it appears not to have been achieved. Uh, next slide, please, Andy. OK, thank you very much indeed. So here are some ideas how to fix it. The first is limit SMCR to senior managers only. So reduce in quantum by perhaps 90% the number of people who are covered by it. The reason is by focusing, you can have much enhanced checks, supervision and jeopardy for the genuine key executives, the people at the top who are supposed to be running the affair. 
By doing this, you deny the regulators any grounds for outsourcing or rushing the process. There is no hiding place. You've got to do it properly. What really matters, in my view, is responsibility maps. They are the one part of SMCR that has the potential to have some value. Uh, those basically show who is responsible for which areas. And it's crucial to ensure that there are no overlaps and no underlaps. If there is an overlap, there are several people who could be responsible. But of course, the buck never stops with one. If there are underlaps, then nobody is responsible. It was nobody's fault. So paying attention to those responsibility maps is, in my view, almost more important than the checks. It avoids also the scenario known as deputy heads will roll. You know, when something goes wrong, the people at the top will look for a scapegoat a tier below themselves. It also prevents the FCA and the PRA from scapegoating non-entities. One of the things that people often say about, uh, who don't know about the kind of work that we do about captured regulation is, well, actually the FCA cannot be a captured regulator because sometimes it does force against people and firms. Yes, but usually they're the little people. You know, the people who are holding outside the regulatory perimeter or, you know, people in tiny little firms. And a cynic might say the reason why the SMCR was extended both downwards in terms of within the big organisations such as banks and also downwards in terms of the types of organisations was precisely so that there would be some small fry that they could enforce against so that it would look like the SMCR was being used. So far, there's not been a lot of that, but I'm sure it will come in time. The problem we have, therefore, is that the process at the moment is less impactful than it should be on the good actors and is denying bad ones a hiding place. So uh, the next thing, of course, to do is to rebrand and refocus as a senior manager's certification and accountability regime. And again, accountability, I tell the size because it's really important. So these are things that TTF has been campaigning for along the way, and I think that they are very relevant in the context of how we can hold senior managers to account. One would be to introduce a duty of care owed by authorised persons, which means the individuals on the register, as well as the firms, to consumers. So this would not be within necessarily the SMCR, but it's something within the gift of the regulators. Now, the beauty of that, and it is the beauty, is that it turns every wronged consumer into an enforcer because it gives them the opportunity to sue, not just the firm, but also the senior managers, any of them that are on the FCA's register, the authorised persons. The next thing that they could do, and this is something that might work as well on the prudential side, not just the conduct side, is require firms to introduce personal guarantees for senior managers. Now, when we look at what's going on in the world of uh, banks mistreating uh, the directors of SMEs, we find that in most cases where there's been bank lending, there are personal guarantees in place in favour of the bank signed by directors. Sometimes there are problems about how those have been obtained. Often they're obtained down the barrel of a gun. Uh, maybe they've not been executed as they should be. Sometimes signatures have been allegedly forged or there's been force majeure placed, I'm uh, sorry, uh, undue pressure placed on these people to actually sign up to these things. Um, but nonetheless, those things exist and they certainly focus the minds of the directors of firms on how they handle risk. So why is it that shareholders don't have the power to impose similar things on the senior managers of their firms? Because those senior managers who are supposedly the agents of the shareholders, paid very well and able to participate in the upside that's created. Why shouldn't they participate in the downside where the downside is caused by their own negligence? or dishonesty. Now, funnily enough, in America, this does happen. Jess Staley, for example, is on the receiving end of such claims right now. Maybe we should have the same thing in the UK. Maybe one of the things that we could do as part of the Edinburgh reforms is actually to de-risk being a shareholder in a quoted company very substantially by creating these sorts of powers, only where shareholders want them, and maybe we could, in this case of financial services businesses, particularly the systemically important ones, we could introduce them by default. If directors knew that they would be bankrupted, if a firm, for example, you know, required support from the taxpayer, you know, such as a bank rescue, or if a firm was to go into default 
and its liabilities were to be picked up by the FSCS. In those circumstances, you would find those individuals far more risk averse and far more inclined towards good behavior. Um, these things together turn all of us, consumers and shareholders, into an enforcement department. Crowdsourced justice cannot be captured and is not resource constrained, which are the concerns about a regulator. I, in my very early career, I was a motoring journalist. This is the early 1990s. It was the era when airbags were being introduced to cars. And one of the journalists that I used to work alongside said he thought it would lead to people taking more risks. There are risks being taken by the driver on behalf of, for example, cyclists and pedestrians, people who don't have the benefit of the airbags that they do. And this journalist half jokingly said, if you replace, replace airbags with spikes, drivers will be more careful. Now, I'm thinking that in the financial services industry, when things go well, particularly in the large firms, the departures of those who cause the problems tend to be very nicely feather bedded. If there were instead spikes in place of those feathers, perhaps they would behave differently. Uh, so final slide, please, Andy. Um, those are my thoughts about the SMCR. Uh, they are actually not only about strictly the senior manager certification regime, they're also about other ways of holding senior managers to account, a lot of which would take the pressure off the FCA and would also diversify responsibility among uh, members of the public, consumers and shareholders. I would appreciate people's thoughts. Mark, thank you very much indeed. As you always do, you provided a very clear, very precise and compelling uh, accounts of your thoughts. Mark, thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, a, a lot of the conversations we're going to hear from Mark and from Professor Llewellyn, from Steve Middleton, there's going to be quite a bit of overlap between the, the narratives. So what I suggest we do is we go straight from Mark to David, and then we'll pick up on all of the points that are discussed in the sort of the, the discussion in the Q&A piece afterwards. But just in case anybody's itching to make a point now, please raise your hand either digitally or literally. If you really do want to make a point now rather than later, please let me know. Otherwise, we're going to go straight from Mark to Professor David Llewellyn. I think we're going straight to Professor Llewellyn. So Professor Llewellyn, if you can please take yourself off mute. And um, to remember, it's the microphone icon at the bottom left of your Zoom screen. And after we've heard from David, we're going to okay. hear from Steve Middleton, who's going to talk about a very specific point around a legal carve out that I think um, might be particularly interesting right. to lots of you. Professor Llewellyn, thank okay, you. Okay, well, thank you very much. much. Over to you. Thank you. Andy, and thank you for uh, the, the previous uh, comments. I mean, our starting point is that apparently the plan is that tens of thousands of finance workers could become exempt from the senior managers regime. When I was chair of the banking stakeholder group of the European Banking Authority, I argued very strongly that we should emphasize more the individual rather than the institution in terms of accountability. I and mean, in fact, I would actually argue that you need both, but for slightly different reasons. So I think what is being proposed, in my view, is strongly a retrograde step. And as you argued yourself, uh, Andy, is designed to emphasize competition and growth. There is a new agenda now with respect to financial regulation, where the Treasury is putting pressure on regulators to always bear in mind the impact on competition and growth, particularly of the financial services sector. I will argue against that in general at, at a later stage. Um, so I think the move that's being planned is a retrograde step. It's an inappropriate focus for the FCA to concentrate on anything other than consumer protection. And I believe, as you said, Andy, that consumer protection will be compromised as a result of, of this. So what I'm arguing, um, 
we talk a lot about accountability and, and uh, Mark emphasized that quite rightly so. All I would want to add is to underline the word effective accountability. We have quite a lot of what I call nominal accountability with uh, FCA and others being required to make representations at the Treasury Committee. But in my view, uh, it's not effective. And there are various reasons for that. And I think one of the reasons is because we give too much emphasis on institutions rather than individuals. And I think both should be made accountable and there should be mechanisms to ensure that both individual decision makers and institutions in which they work should be accountable. So my central argument would be that we need to bring accountability and sanctions closer to the actual decision makers. I have a nice word here, um, which I'm sure none of you have ever used in conversation, but implicitly we are doing it all the time. And that word is anthropomorphization. Anthropomorphization. It's difficult to say and it's even more difficult to spell. What we mean by that is that we treat inanimate objects as if they had human characteristics. So if you come to um, decision making, who is actually making the decision? It's not the institution, it's certain key or perhaps not always key individuals within that institution. And I'm often amused uh, in my own university when people say to me, the university has decided that something no, that's not the right focus. What we really ought to say is, well, who actually decided that? Whether it be right or whether it be wrong, we need to know who are the real uh, decision makers. And so my general argument would be, we need to make accountability and sanctions for wrongdoing as close as possible we can get to the real decision makers in the system. It's in the final analysis, what this regime should be about is about accountability, about the incidence of sanctions, when sanctions are made, who actually pays the fines? Mark, you mentioned, I think, shareholders. Yes, that may be the case. I have a sneaking concern that somewhere along the line, in some cases, it can be the consumers where the actual incidence of expensive sanctions are actually placed. Unwittingly, but nevertheless, uh, in certain circumstances, it can be the consumers who actually end up through prices, etc., for paying the, um, the fines. So it's about accountability, who actually pays the sanctions, and of course it's also about incentive structures. Those are the three key areas that the senior management regime should be about. So why should we not dilute the senior regime as is being proposed? So to sum up, one, we need effective rather than just nominal accountability. Secondly, that requires that the focus should be more on where the decisions are actually made within an institution. Thirdly, we need to consider who actually in the end pays the sanction costs. Is it the shareholder? Is it the customer? Is it the individual uh, wrongdoing or who. And the other final reason why I'm very much worried about this watering down is that it is a signaling of a diluting of uh, consumer protection. And that is the last thing 
that any regulatory change ought to be doing. So <clears throat> my argument would be that when we impose sanctions for wrongdoing, there should be some on the individual who's actually responsible if we can identify that. But not only the individual, because after all, it is unfair, perhaps, to sanction somebody who is actually behaving in line with the culture of an organization as established by the senior management and board of directors. So my argument would be that if you want to create incentive structures, a small, relatively small fine on individual decision makers is going to have a bigger impact on their future behavior than a much larger fine on the institution as a whole. And therefore, I think the skill will be to try to get that mix between individual and institutional accountability together with individual and institutional sanctions to get that right. It's a big challenge, but one way of not doing that is to water down what we've already got. Just finally, on a slightly broader aspect, you see, I think the proposed changes to the senior management regime is part of a bigger picture why, de deriving from the Edinburgh arrangements. And that is a bigger picture towards lighter regulation, particularly to give more emphasis to the implications for growth and competitiveness of the financial services sector. A couple of reasons why I think that is totally inappropriate. Firstly, I'm not convinced that doing so that I would not, I'm not convinced that by slightly or even largely easing up on regulation of consumer protection, I'm not convinced that that would have an impact on growth and competitiveness. We haven't got time to discuss it, but I think I could argue the opposite, that good, tighter regulation, well, not necessarily tighter than what we've got, but good, strong regulation, actually would help competitiveness and um, economic growth. My second reason is, is what, when I used to teach macroeconomics a few years ago, what is called the, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes, sorry, something's odd in my, on my screen. Something we used to call the Tinbergen principle. And that is, you should have as many instruments as you as you've got policy targets to try to achieve more than one target just by one instrument or one arrangement or one institution is almost bound to lead to trouble because conflicts will sooner or later arise between those different objectives so as the Americans might say, keep it simple, stupid. Much more focused institutions, regulatory institutions, are much more effective, in my view, than if you overload them with too many uh, other functions. Thirdly, the more you overload a regulator with different objectives, the more difficult it's going to be to make them accountable. And the reason is quite simply that they can always say, ah, but on that particular occasion, I was giving a little bit more emphasis to growth and competitiveness. So you can sort of arbitrage between the different objectives in a way that in practice can lead to an erosion of the effective accountability. Also, I would argue, as I'm sure everyone around the table would argue, that consumer protection should be the total utmost priority at all times and in all circumstances. And the more you load the FCA with other so-called subsidiary functions, 
the more that <clears throat> consumer protection is likely to be eroded or compromised. And finally, I would argue the, what the management uh, stretch argument. That again, the more objectives that you impose upon a regulatory agency, the more demanding management is. And if you look through the minutes of the FCA board meetings, you will find several occasions where there's been discussion about what is called management overload or management stretch. And again, that partly arises because we're making the objectives too clear, uh, too, too extensive and not sufficiently focused. So that's a slightly different approach to the discussion, a more general sort of almost philosophical side, but I think there are some issues there that need to be taken into account. I'll leave it at that. Professor Llewellyn, thank you so, so much. Um, we're always uh, grateful to you for providing such a rich set of thoughts, your, your insights and the relevance of your uh, experiences is, is absolutely first class. There's no, no doubt about that whatsoever. I think some of you may well know that Professor Llewellyn, as, as well as Sue Lewis, who's with us today, as well as David Pitt Watson and others, are, um, have volunteered very kindly to be on the uh, recommendations panel for the uh, core for evidence about the financial conduct authority that's being carried out by the all party parliamentary group on personal banking and fair financial services. And um, it's very, very clear that we have an outstanding panel of co contributors to that, including, as you, as you just heard, uh, from Professor Lewin. Thank you very much. We're going to hear from our third and final main speaker, Steve Middleton, before we open things up to Q&A and conversation. Um, Steve's going to talk you through something that when I first heard it, I really had to scratch my head and sort of said to myself, is this possibly true? Because it's just so, so significant. It's so incredibly significant. So please do tune into the words that we're going to hear now from Mr. Steve Middleton. Steve, over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Andy, and thanks, uh, Mark and Pro Pro Professor Llewellyn. I, I agree by and large with the majority of what you've said, except my position would be I would entirely scrap SMCR. SMCR was a huge step backwards. Uh, it, it, it achieved the opposite of what it was supposed to achieve. Um, your big issue after the last financial crisis, in theory, was naming who was responsible for which areas had gone wrong because people were changing job titles and roles and suggesting it wasn't their responsibility. Ultimately, it should have fallen on the directors in the key areas. Uh, and, and those directors could all have been faced criminal prosecutions directly under the approved persons regime. The APA rules that are in place and the FCA zone principles can all be used to chastise, fine, investigate, and potentially carry out criminal investigations, certainly under the, the APA rules against bank directors. And that did not happen, but it does happen. It happens all of the time. Uh, that's not the key issue I'm speaking about, but I think it's important to recognize the fact that even if you look at say, FCA fines, uh, I just glanced a, a few earlier, and look at fines against individuals, and I, I'm looking at some fines in 2019, ones against a guy called Paul Stephanie, and they actually fine him for breaches of statements of principle two and three, observing proper standards of market conduct and failing to act with due skill, care and diligence. Um, Stuart Owen Ford, APA 1, APA 4 and FIT, mis-selling, failing to be open and cooperating, a lack of fitness, propriety, conflicts of interest. Uh, Mark John Owen, uh, this is a 3.2 million fine, breaches by an ex executive director of APA 1, APA 4 and FIT related to a lack of fitness and propriety and failing to act on information appropriately in the asset management sector. I mean, these are serious fines and people lose their licenses and potentially face criminal prosecutions under the approved person's rules. That is what has always been there and could happen. And those rules worked. There is a statement of principles and if people breach those principles knowingly and directors do or allow other people to in an organisation and don't act, they can face criminal prosecutions. 
SMCR came in, and then under SMCR, the only way you could face a criminal prosecution effectively was if the bank itself failed. Now, how was that a step forward? Yeah, the SMCR gave gave directors mm. a chance to create, uh, and as Mark rightly says, the responsibility map should be the key document, except they don't lodge those responsibility maps with the FCA. They can be requested to provide them when there's a problem, but I would suggest if I'm a director of a senior bank, I'm going to have a nicely prepared little route map with a blank box in the bottom that if I have a problem, I'm going to fill in and send on to the FCA, and it will be my junior or a... Um, a, a, a head of a, gr a group next to me that was I had will suddenly find notes that, that I'd made responsible for those particular areas. Um, so, so the SMCR to me was a it was a complete cop out. It was a way to just make bank directors almost well, you know, again um, invincible because I say unless the bank fails, all you can actually do is find them and potentially serve private notices against them. So how does that help any consumer know what's going on in a bank? Um, so that 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 to me the whole the whole Steve, regime. Thank sorry, yeah. Thank you. I'm I'm cutting in. I, I would have left it to the end, but Mark's put his hand up. What you're just talking about is um, is remarkably interesting. So bear with me because Mark put his hand up. So he's, he he wants to come in now. If that's okay with you, Steve. Uh, Mark, I'm I'm I'll to wait until the end unless you want me to go now, but. Um, if you do want me to go now, there's a tactical question, which is this. When I was writing my presentation, in a way, my thinking was not dissimilar to Steve's. Um, mm. the, the thought I had was actually flooding the FCA with huge numbers of supposed senior mm. managers, many of whom are not senior at all, obfuscates rather than helps. That's why exactly. I said just cut it back to those who are genuinely senior and Mark, provide I, I, I a responsibility map. I completely mm -hmm. agree, but what I'm saying is we actually have those rules already exactly. in the handle. Exactly. And this gives so them a way to yeah. So, Sorry, so here was a thought that this is a tactical question because the whole business about the Edinburgh reforms is corporatism. It is that in the run-up to a general election, the, the front benches of the two main parties are having a competition to see who can be most city friendly in order to get donations and endorsements as they come into power. And whoever is in power will need to keep issuing debt and get the bankers on their sides. So it's a win-win as far as they're concerned. The only people who lose are citizens. So what we could do is we could say, we understand that mm. there is a big backlog of applications under SMCR. We sympathise with that. We understand there's a problem that it takes three months to approve one of these things, whereas it's done in a week in, in Bermuda. So why don't we scrap the entire thing and all we need is for every authorised firm to provide an up-to-date responsibility map limited to those people who are already authorised persons and that is up-to-date and shows no gaps and no uh, overlaps. That, to, to, be honest, Mark, that, Mark, that, to be honest, that's all you need. All you need yeah, yeah. was names in roles, yeah, because the responsibilities are quite clear. If you're head of risk, you're head of risk. And if you're having issues reported to you in terms of, say, swap mis selling or other issues and you're not acting on it or market abuse or other things, then there is a clear responsibility in that position because you've got to, you've got to report directly to the board on those risks. So yeah. you, you, you just clearly need responsibilities and names in on those seats. Yes, I mean, I do think that responsibility maps have some value purely because in, in the imperfect world, job descriptions are ambiguous and people can yeah, say it wasn't yeah. me, it was that person. Um, but but I also think that if you want belt and braces, you go with the two other measures which I've described, which is um, duty of care applies to in, and that applies to individuals and is civilly actionable so yeah. that citizens can go after the senior managers where the regulators are trying to protect them. And, this, and the third one, which is even to be safer, is to have the some obligation, particularly for systemically important firms, that there are personal guarantees signed by senior managers. I appreciate this stuff is outside of the Overton window, but the funny thing is actually it's in keeping with the espoused rhetoric of those who support the Edinburgh reforms. If they really believe in what they're saying, then they ought to agree with us, shouldn't they? If you if you run a financial services firm, as I have done, I've run my own firms and, and trained people uh, and advised and, and, and taken all the rails on, you, you, you take that responsibility full on at the end of the day if you put your name to that firm and you sit in that director's role then you face all the consequences and what the banks have managed to do and smcr has allowed them to do is dilute that risk away yeah. 
at all times from senior directors. And um, but look, I mean, the, the, my main yeah. point wasn't that. What, what, what I looked into. Steve, bear with me a second. Bear with me a second. We're going to, if you don't mind, Steve, could I invite David Pitt Watson to share his thoughts? I know David's going to be disappearing in a couple of minutes. David, if you want to, just before you have to go, just share anything you'd like to share before you you skedaddle into the rest of your evening, David. Uh, well, I'm, no, I've really enjoyed the presentations. I think they're they they uh, as as so often suggest that there's a simpler lower cost way of getting what it is that we all want, which is a financial services industry that that, that serves its consumers. David, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Let's go back to Steve Middleton. And there's a, a question I'm, I'm itching to ask Steve, if, but uh, I'll, I'll wait to the end. Steve, back to you. Thanks, David. Thank you, David. Yes, Steve. The, the issue I focused on on SMCR was um, I've been involved in a number of court cases, <clears throat> peripherally involved, where... The, there's been some appalling behaviours on disclosure. So documents have been withheld, key documents that were crucial to the, the cases. Documents were being um, been forged, and I say that quite openly and honestly. Um, documents were being manufactured. Uh, we had one case where Mark Wright and I, Bank Confidential, worked on where I think of 29 loan documents produced. Whistleblowers who looked at the documents who all used to work producing those documents would only state that one was genuine of 29 documents in a court case, uh, 29 learned documents. So I, I, what I started doing is looking into who was responsible for disclosure in court, who was responsible for the behaviour of the legal teams, because to me, this is the, one of the biggest effects on consumers. You, you haven't got a chance in taking the banks on, because not only do they have a huge legal team, they will literally manufacture their case on almost every occasion, and they get away with it on almost every occasion. And when I started looking into it, I, I, I hadn't realised this, but in a very late consultation on who would take what responsibilities under SMCR, the FCA had allowed the legal function of the banks to be carved out. So that, that means in what's happening in those court cases, what happens with the disclosure, what happens with the discovery, does not fall under any one direct SMCR individual. Now, the FCA try and dance around this by suggesting that overall people always have responsibilities in the bank. But the reality is this isn't true, because if you make a lawyer the head of the SO of the, the head of the legal function in a bank, and that lawyer is not an authorized person or an approved person, then effectively there is no SMCR position under the legal team. And this also crosses over into G. DPR and data protection, because again, all the problems people have had when they've done data subject access requests and not been able to get the right documents through. The banks can also class documents as legally privileged if any advice is given around them, or if it can, can relate to a court case. So let's say you have somebody comes forward with a very serious complaint. And the first thing they're going to do is try and ask for information from the bank. Now, that could be a DSA or just a genuine request for information. Now, all you have to do there is get the legal team involved at that point, and the legal team starts advising the bank. They've immediately tied a number of documents up and a number of communications up with legal privilege. And then in data subject access terms, they can withhold documents that may relate to those ongoing uh, legal battles. So they, they've completely carved out this whole area of... Um, of information and correct information and genuine information in both complaints, procedures, and in court processes. And when they went to the final consultation, I can't remember how many it was now, maybe about 50 or 60 people, not one consumer or consumer organization was involved in that consultation. It was all undisclosed consultants or private consultants, probably many of whom worked for the banks. And the only consumer people they had in theory representation they had was the FCA's own consumer liaison panel. But, you know, they have people from the legal firms that work for the banks on those panels. Or, okay, they do have one or two people that might represent consumers, but everyone pretty much recognises that panel is captured. Um, so, so to me, th this goes to the heart of what's going on in the banks. When you have problems, when you've got mis-selling, when you've got misbehaviors, you've got malpractices, the first thing that will happen is the bank bank's legal team will discuss with risk or the senior directors or whoever they're dealing with, the risk to the bank, the financial risk to the bank.
And that is what always happens. It happens in whistleblowing. If you go to, say, RBS, mm -hmm. and you go to their whistleblowing team, that team produces a report that it hands straight to the legal team. But that legal team is the team you might end up taking on if you end up in an employment dispute. And they straight away will advise the bank on, on its risk in relation to what you're whistleblowing. So, so effectively, this whole issue of wrongdoing in the banks and the, the responsibility to report this has been completely carved out of SMCR. And they even had the cheat to say, it, I think, on one point that there were concerns that lawyers might see wrongdoing or something similar happening in the bank and feel a responsibility to report it. That was one of the reasons they carved it out. So to, to me, the, the SMCR regime is, in total has been a, a huge failure. I, I, won't, I won't read any of the emails I've got, got out on this now, but I'll, I'll put some notes together for you that Andy can circulate. Yes, and it's quite shocking, really, the FCA's responses in relation to this. Um, uh, but, but to me, they've just given the banks a way to yet again, dodge responsibility for the most serious malpractices within a bank. Incredible stuff, really incredible stuff. Before we do any, anything else, I know there's just a few of us today, but before we do anything else, can I please applaud Mark and Professor Llewellyn and Steve Middleton for the preparation and presentation today. Thank you very, very much indeed. The quality is, uh, the quality is absolutely first class, absolutely first class. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, I'm itching to ask you a question, Steve. Based on what you said earlier, that they didn't need to introduce SMCR, there was already a means by which they could actually hold individuals accountable, right? Was that ability to hold people accountable, was it around at the time of and after the global financial crisis? Could they have used it then? Yeah, it was around. Um, I'll try and find out when, I'll try and find out when APA came in while we're on, Andy, but I'll, I'll reset the timeline on the... Uh, but yeah, yeah, it was certainly around, and uh, it's the approved person regime. You know, See, it's I, what, what I, I used to work under. To use plain English, this is freaking me out a little bit because I was under the delusion that we needed S SMCR. It's like I said at the beginning. I really believe what I said at the beginning. We needed SMCR because there was a lack of personal accountability. Because if what you're saying is right, Steve then the mechanisms were there to hold people to account, but they chose not to use them. And that's an even more state of affairs. That's, that's horrible. So the rules that I've just quoted to you where they're finding these people on, I'm going to try and drop it into the chat, came in between 2001 and 2007. My goodness me. It makes me wonder, I, I, forgive me, I'm starting to sound seriously cynical here, but it makes me wonder if... Just they, have a look, Andy, if you look at that link, Sorry, yeah, I'm just yeah. personally, if you click on that link while you're on, you, you will see what I'm saying. So the, the, the April 1 and what I was quoting to you there that someone was being fined on in 2019, uh, what was in place, I think, in 2001. So, um, was it, so was it, forgive my language here, I won't use the actual word, but was it then BS that they didn't have a means to which hold, to hold people to account? Yeah, yeah. I've well, read this with them on a number of occasions. Um, they're, 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 because obviously I know people have been fined. I know people have been fined. I know people have been struck off under these those rules. I, I once put. Do you remember when there was all this issue about the tailored business loans and whether they were regulated or not? Yeah. And they, they kept saying, "No, we can't take any action." Well, it was admitted by David Thorburn, I think it was in the Treasury Select Committee meetings, that they effectively had devised a product to get around the rules. Now, there is a specific rule in the approved persons rules. That state, if you've devised a product effectively to get around the rules, that in itself can be a criminal offence. Yeah. So you, 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 this is, all this, we can't take out. It's, it's a bit like when they say we can't, and I've tried to explain this to people, when they say we couldn't take any more action against GRG because it's not regulated, the bank is regulated. When they say we can't take action on this product because it's not a regulated product, they sue people continually under the... Um, under the approved persons rules, under the principles for unregulated products, any investment sold in the UK, regulated or unregulated, falls under the remit of the FCA. This is and serious stuff, Jen. This is serious, serious, serious stuff. I, 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 I can't quite believe how naive I've been. Steve, thank you. Mark, you want to come in there, sir? Mark? Yeah. Um, I think that the chronology is as Steve describes. What happened was after the GFC, there was the Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards. And famously, it came up with this phrase in its report, 
the buck that does not stop with the individual stops nowhere. The regulators had succeeded in persuading that committee that under the rules that existed, it was all very difficult and there was nothing that they could do. Now, we may take the view that that was frankly bullshit from start to finish, or we may be more charitable and take the view that uh, difficulties over the ambiguity of job descriptions, which had overlapping rules and responsibilities and had gaps in them and stuff like that. That was the real reason why they may have had difficulty in some cases in enforcing against individuals. Whichever view you take, it could have been solved with proper responsibility maps. It did not need SMCR, but they managed to persuade the politicians that SMCR was needed. When SMCR, which required legislation, went through Parliament, there were two changes that watered it down, both of them very significant. And the first one is that they removed a presumption of guilt. The presumption of guilt said, if you were responsible for subject X and something went wrong with subject X, you were to blame. That was removed. The second one was non-executives were removed entirely from the map. Now, of course, I'm not suggesting that that would be because maybe former politicians, treasury officials or anybody like that might one day become non-executive directors of financial services businesses. It was certainly helpful to a certain category of person. Now, uh, again, as Steve says, there is not a problem with going after uh, senior managers or rather authorised persons in respect of unregulated activities under the existing rules. And I could give a really good case because by chance in a million, it happened to somebody I went to school with. Now, you might remember, I think it was about 2015, uh, there were stories in the press about Britain's biggest fare dodger. It was said that somebody had been commuting in from somewhere in rural East Sussex to London Bridge uh, and had not been paying. And they had managed to rack up 40 or 50,000 pounds worth of unpaid paid fares. Um, and it subsequently emerged that it was Jonathan Burroughs, a divisional managing director within Black Rock. Now, by chance, I went to school with him. He was in the same year as me, and we tended to sit in alphabetical order. My surname is Bishop. It's not surprising I sat next to Jonathan Burroughs. So I knew the guy quite well. He was just a prankster. Uh, he was the kind of person who would do this to rebel against the system. Um, he had been plenty of money, he was earning very good salary. And crucially, although perhaps in an ideal world, we wouldn't have people managing people's money who go around trying to dodge fares. You know, no financial services product was affected by his actions. There was no suggestion that any consumers were harmed in any way. The FCA managed to persuade him to accept a lifetime ban from financial services. How many people have done things far worse than that that do involve you know, financial services products have caused consumer harm and in many cases have also involved regulated activities and they managed to come away without a lifetime ban. A really good example would be the senior management team at Link Financial Services. They've got Arch Crew, Connaught and now Woodford behind them and it's very clear from the announcement the FCA made last week that they are actually not going to get anything uh, happen to them at all in respect of Woodford where billions of pounds were lost. So this is really about the will of the regulator, not about what the rules are. And that's why I'm saying whatever we put forward, I think we should include ways that citizens can circumvent the regulators because the regulators are not going to act. This is actually really worrying. I'll, I'll go to Dave, Professor Llewellyn in a moment, and then we'll ask Nigel if he wants to chip in with any thoughts as well. This is really worrying because we're effectively saying that, you know what, the real problem here is the regulators don't want to regulate. Um, they've, they've, got the, they've got the armory, the toolkit, the mechanisms to do what needs to be done, but there's a reluctance to do so. That speaks to the issues that Professor Wedding was speaking about earlier, conflicts of interest, revolving door, capture. Um, my goodness me, I am genuinely, genuinely having to rethink what's been going on. After all these years, I'm once again shocked at how game the system is. I nearly swore then. Um, Professor Llewellyn, would you like to come in at this point? And I can see we've got, we've got a mark and get his thoughts as well. 
Thank you, Professor Llewellyn. Bottom left of your Zoom screen is where you'll see that microphone icon and you click on it and you should be able to speak. Perfect. Now, just a very brief point. I mean, I think more and more we're coming to the conclusion that the really fundamental underlying issue is the culture of the Financial Conduct Authority. And we can talk a lot about the details of what has gone wrong with the FCA, their attitude to whistleblowers, their apparently sometimes reluctance to take action, et cetera, et cetera. When it comes down to it, the big picture is one of culture. And somehow that has to change. How we do that is another question. But I think we do have to recognize that something is, I think, fairly fundamentally wrong within the FC F FCA's culture. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much indeed. Um, absolutely. We'll go to Mark and then we'll go to Steve. Mark, your hands up. Go for it. Thank you, Andy. So I agree with David that the, the problem here is the culture of the regulator. The question of how to fix it. Personally, I wouldn't try and fix the culture because I think it's too difficult and they'd be too obstructive. What I would do instead is fix the incentives. Um, and here's a way of doing it. And this is so often, you know, when we look at the problems of what goes on in financial services, I believe this is the root cause. You've got to remove the FCA's immunity from civil liability. If you did that, if there was a, a senior manager who did something wrong and the regulator let them get away with it, and then they did something wrong to somebody else, that person would then sue the regulator for the harm that they suffered. Basically, what you'd be doing is you'd be f firing footballs at an open goal. And each time you hit, you get a goal, the industry suffers an increase in the levy because of the cost of, to the FCA of compensating that consumer. And before long, the honest majority in the industry will say, yeah, maybe we thought we were gaining a little bit by having lax and captured regulation. But actually, we keep getting hit for these huge increases in the levy. This is getting out of hand. We actually need proper financial regulation. Fix yourselves, FCA, or else we're going to knock on the door of politicians and insist you're all replaced. That is the point at which it'll get fixed. So I actually believe, if you believe in root causes and that how you solve the problem, you've got to get rid of their immunity. Fascinating stuff. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Um, which makes me think about that quote. I'm always quoting um, the Charlie Munger quote. Um, Charlie Munger being Warren Buffett's right-hand man. Uh, show me the incentives and I'll show you, you the outcome. Um, at the moment, it is as if, uh, it is as if, as if the dynamics within the regulatory framework actually encourages something akin to obfuscation and pulling punches and not doing the job properly. Um, capture, revolving door, reasons why not. What we need is something that's going to compel exactly the right kind of um, exactly the right kind of actions. Mark, after Steve's spoken, I'm going to ask you to talk about that chap on the life of Mars. You know that program you sometimes refer to. I'll ask you to refer to that in a minute because I think it's really apt. Mr. Steve Middleton, back to you, sir. Oh, bottom left, uh, you, you're on mute, Steve. So, sorry, you, you've got to remember that uh, the, the, the Treasury and, and a large large group, group think approach of Westminster is that we promote the city at all ends. And part of promoting the city is promoting a regulator that will let you come in and abuse its consumers, which is what makes London so popular. And 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 that that the FCA themselves are, are a promotional tool. That's that's well recognised, I believe, amongst most investment houses. That that you will get away with murder effectively over here compared to what you can do in many other jurisdictions. And you have this organisation calling itself independent, but at the end of the day, you have a financial policy committee that can instruct it what to do on a comply or explain basis. Now you've got six members of the Bank of England on there, you've got the chief executive of the FCA, you've got a voting member from the Treasury on there and some, some independent experts. 
So, and, and these people will all put financial, what they call the financial stability and, and the, the keeping the markets operating pro properly as their number one incentive. In other words, making the city make money. Uh, and that's where the problem lies, Andy. You've got a, a regulator that, that is there to propagate and support and promote the financial abuse that's been going on in here for years. And 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 it it can't it can't ever work with them in situ because they they have no, you know, their their whole their whole ethos is to make the markets work well. And when you've got to say this comply or explain position with this financial policy committee, even if they wanted to put things right, I don't think they could, the way it's all set up. There is no real independence in that organization. Incredible. Thanks, Steve. Um, Mark, live on Mars. Uh, share your thoughts around that, please. Thank you. OK, so uh, live on Mars, I often say to Andy, when I'm talking about the culture of the FCA, that it's an organisation that spends a lot of time and money talking about diversity. What it's talking about is diversity of identity. So, you know, for example, it is a much higher uh, proportion of ethnic minority employees than the general population of the UK. Yet it tries to hire even more of them. It is spectacularly more LBGT than the general population, yet it's trying to hire, hire more of them. Us, middle-aged and older, you know, heterosexual white guys, you know, we may be actually underrepresented in that organization compared to the general population. But actually, the issue is really about diversity of opinion, which often comes from life experience. So when I've been to the FCA and dealt with the people there, what I find is almost everybody has a degree. Most of those degrees are in law. Most of them are from the same few Russell Group universities or the overseas equivalents. So in terms of diversity of experience and opinion, they have almost none. Now, this guy is my poster, poster boy, if you like, for genuine diversity at the FCA. Gene Hunt, D.I. Gene Hunt from Life on Mars and Ashes to Ashes. Do you remember those TV series from a few years ago? Here he is with his... Um, Audi Quattro, fire up the Quattro volley, he used to say. Um, and the character he played was a little bit racist, a little bit sexist, a little bit homophobic, a little bit violent. Um, but actually, what he had was an absolute burning desire to nail criminals. He would be up at dawn, kicking down doors in order to lock them up so old grannies could be sleeping soundly in their beds at night. I don't see that kind of person at the FCA, and I would like to see them pursuing a diversity initiative that involves people like that being hired. Not just people literally like that, but people who have the same kind of motivations and experiences. I would love an FCA chief executive to come to us and say, you guys have interesting ideas about fixing the FCA. Who wants a job? Who wants to be a non-executive? Who wants to be a consultant to us? Come in and speak to our people. That's never going to happen under the current leadership. Now, Steve has put a point of view, which may be right or may be wrong, which is that as long as the FCA is under pressure from, for example, the statutory panels, from you know, the Monetary Policy Committee, Financial Policy Committee, from the Treasury, and I do believe the Treasury is the centre point of pro-city corporatism in the UK, as long as it's under pressure from those people, it will never be on the consumer side. I think that's probably true. However, I do believe that there will come a tipping point. And let me describe to you why I believe there'll be a tipping point. And it's this. The things that are in the interests of bad actors in the industry, particularly the things that are in the interests of some bankers, are not actually in the interests of the entire financial services sector or the entire economy. So as an example, if consumers in the UK are scared of the financial service industry, they hear about Woodford or Blackmore Bond or any of those things, perhaps as they're getting a bit older, they might not want to downsize their property because they think that bricks and mortar are safe, but investments are unsafe. If, that's ha if that happens, the economy suffers in two ways. Firstly, family-sized properties will not be vacated by elderly empty nesters and therefore will not become available to young couples thinking of starting families. That's a problem. Secondly, actually three problems. Secondly, 
the capital tied up in property is not being liberated to invest in shares to provide capital for businesses to grow and create employment. And thirdly, the financial services industry is missing out on profitable opportunities to sell good quality investment products to those consumers. So the problem here we have is not actually that the treasury is acting in the interests of the financial services industry or the wider economy and against the interests of consumers. It, it's been captured by a small subsector of the city, particularly the banks, maybe also some asset managers, and it's being persuaded by them that the things that serve their interests serve the interests of the wider economy, which is not true. And I think for us as campaigners, the opportunity here is to try to persuade politicians and particularly treasury ministers that they are actually acting against the interests of the wider financial service sector and the economy by trying to protect the interests of a small minority of bad actors. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Uh, we're going to go to Nigel Cairns for his thoughts, and then we'll start bringing things to a close. It really genuinely chaps, and, and there's, there's only chaps left. It, it genuinely has been, for me, a remarkably informative conversation, much more than I thought. Um, much more than I thought it was going to be. I thought I knew it all. I certainly, certainly don't. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Professor Llewellyn. Nigel, any thoughts you'd like to quickly throw in before we start bringing things to a close? Um, yes, there were a few points that I would like to make. Um, firstly, I wanted to pick up on something that uh, Steve um, Middleton said a few minutes ago. Um, and that's, although this this uh, particular meeting was about SMCR, uh, he also raised the issue of where the real start point for, for the whole issue is, um, which is not necessarily um, discreet under the, uh, the SMCR. And, and for me, uh, it's most certainly, um, I think, a requirement to rewrite uh, the first pages of SMCR. In other words, the uh, the basic structure of having a, a conflict or an, a number of objectives which are inherently conflicted is never going to work uh, because you have uh, a stratified uh, a, a approach by the regulator uh, to always favour um, making the markets always win, the markets must work well, and that that has become ingrained from the outset. And uh, the secondary considerations are always the, um, the the consumers. But it's worse than that because there's no, there's no prescribed mechanism of how these uh, decisions should be made. More particularly, uh, no minimum standard is set for consumer um, uh, protection uh, levels. And what I'm thinking about there is that uh, it's not doesn't even apply at the level that the regulations, for instance, in the handbook should be enforced. It's left open uh, on ultra light touch regulation uh, to enforce uh, regulations or not to. Well, clearly that cannot, that cannot be um, uh, consistent with an objective to look after consumers. Yes, it, yet it is uh, because of the conflict um, elements of the way that SMR is set up in the first place. Uh, not, uh, yeah, uh, the um, FSMA is set up in the first place. So I think it's that's the very core of the problem in that, you know, and as it's been um, uh, commented on by Professor Llewellyn, uh, this is now going to be just further diluted with uh, uh, more pressure being put on, on the regulator for competitiveness and uh, op openness to um, to markets for uh, other competitive other people to come in. Um, well, where's the mechanism of how this how this works with the other objectives? There isn't one. It's um, these are political decisions that are being foisted onto the FCA um, with no accountability at all. And the, the politicians, if it all goes wrong, which it will, the politicians can say, oh, well, the, uh, the FCA is, um, uh, 
is independent. They made they they made all the wrong judgments. Nothing to do with us. So nobody's accountable whatsoever. Um, so the thing's absolutely destined to get worse and worse. But very quickly, coming back to um, the, the, the purpose of this particular meeting, um, it seemed to me that um, uh, Mr. Griffiths and, 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 and the Edinburgh um, ob objectives came up with this idea that um, uh, the, the competitiveness uh, and the uh, the SM, SMCR should be watered down. Uh, but he's done this um, on the premise that the case has already been proven. Um, well, I don't think it has been proven. Um, I don't think it's even been de debated. They've moved on from it on the basis that this has all been decided, and it hasn't at all. Uh, so I think that's something that ought to ought to be uh, uh, focused upon a little bit. Um, and also, yeah, in particular, uh, you know, th this idea of attractiveness, being attractive to um, new participants from the States, uh, you know, bankers that would love to come over here and... Um, uh, you know, sign up to our systems and and and, and companies that would like to get on the um, uh, you know the trade over here on the registers and what have you, but don't because of the um, uh, the frightening prospect of SMCR. Well, I don't see that at all because, as we've already heard, uh, the Americans have got much more stringent uh, capabilities of, of control than we have under SMCR. So that doesn't wash at all. And it seems entirely plausible to me that the whole idea of getting rid of SMCR is as a result of the lobbying of um, UK finance, the immense power of the lobbying, that we, we you can see it very, very plainly at work all the time. Um, and they just don't want the inconvenience of having having the risk of being hauled up for doing something wrong. They just want completely free reign, as they've always thought they have. And they don't like the SMCR lurking in the background, just in case um, the, the FCA ever sort of uh, decided to get a bit active with it. Um, but I think that's where it's come from. Thank you so much, Nigel, for sharing your thoughts. Um, there really is a very consistent theme coming through. In, in a moment, I'm going to go to Professor Llewellyn for his final thoughts, and then we'll wrap up. But just before we do that, um, I put into the chat a link to a podcast. Actually, when you get to the page, you'll see lots of different podcasts. Go to the one relating to September the 27th, 2022. It's an excellent podcast. Um, a journalist... Um, Lucy McNulty, uh, speaking to John Glenn when he was just recently the former economic secretary to the Treasury. So this is when the Liz Trust government bit happened and he lost his job as the economic secretary to the Treasury. So he's talking in past terms about his role as the economic secretary to the Treasury. And roughly mm. four-fifths of the way through that podcast, I'm not going to try to quote him verbatim. I can't remember the exact words, but the gist of it is he says that he saw his role as a minister um, to be to promote the city of London uh, in Parliament. So there we've got somebody openly expressing his view that his job as a government minister was to promote the city in Parliament. So we don't really need to look much further to start to understand the symmetry of power and influence if the minister himself is actually saying, my job was to promote the city in Parliament. Uh, and that should well, see alarm bells everywhere, shouldn't it, Nigel? Yeah. Clear, clearly, Griffith, since he's, he thinks he's got the same um, instruction oh, manual. Well, 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 there we go. Well, there we go. This is clearly where part of the problems are. Professor Llewellyn, we're going to go to you for, for your final comments, and then we'll bring the session to a close. Thank you. Again, you're going to need to unmute yourself. Thank you. Such a very brief comment. But it's really been a fascinating uh, 
discussion. Just to go back to a point that Nigel made and uh, I was also making about um, growth, productivity, competitiveness being in a sense added on, I like the Christmas tree problem. It's, you know, you have a Christmas tree, let's add more and more and more things until eventually it all falls down. I think it's really, the explanation is quite simple, I think. And that is that competitiveness, productivity, growth has become a, a, one of the major political focuses. And when something like that happens, when there is a sort of overwhelming issue in the economy or in society or whatever, um, what we actually tend to find then is every minister, every government department looks at all the organisations that they are responsible for and then try to think, and how can we make them contribute to more productivity, growth and uh, competitiveness, even though they may be totally inappropriate to undertake mm. that function. And I, I don't want my remarks to be misinterpreted. I'm certainly not against policies to accelerate economic growth, certainly not against policies to increase competitiveness and even to support the city. But tinkering with financial regulation and regulatory agencies is not the way to do it. I come back to my Tinbergen principle, specialization usually produces better results. Other organizations, such as the Competition and Markets Authority, are in a much better position to deal with competition issues, not the FCA. One of the, thank you, Professor Lewin, thank you so much. One of the key learnings for me from today's conversation is the idea that um, for each policy initiative, there needs to be a singular corresponding instrument to deliver that policy. Yes. I absolutely get that. Otherwise, you get this competing uh, priorities issue that you articulated so well earlier. And if I may, just to close the whole session off, um, isn't it rather profound and isn't it rather ironic, even mysterious, that these deregulatory measures are being introduced in an attempt to supercharge the economy and get it to grow again, etc. And if we trace the reasons for the need for that all the way back, we go to the global financial crisis because we still haven't recovered from it. We've had 10 plus years of austerity and we're still trying to dig ourselves out of the hole. The banks took us into in the lead in the first place back in 2008-9. Yeah. It's as I, if think, we... I think there's an additional uh, reason, actually, Andy. That's called Brexit. It's the validation. <laughs> it's validation of Brexit. The government's absolutely panic-stricken to come up with the goods of saying why it was all the good idea. I tried um, so hard to avoid that. Well, <laughs> I tried really hard to avoid saying that. I really did. Um, and I you, think it should be said. It's, it's half past seven, and hence... Of course, it is coming. <laughs> <laughs> very, very good. Gentlemen, we'll wrap it up there. It really has been a fascinating conversation. And of course, it's superbly informed the responses we'll put into the FCA and the PRA. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Nice Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very lovely, much. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Thank you. Bye-bye. I look forward to a glass of wine with you yourself at some stage. Cheers, Nigel. Thanks all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.